You know, last week, as I was stocking up on cough syrup and cold remedies, I was trying desperately to ward off this respiratory problem that had been chasing me. So I stopped and shopped, and I filled up my shopping cart with medicine and cough drops, pulled up to the checkout counter at the store and looked up, and I saw an unfamiliar face. Now, this is certainly some turnover of the staff at this store that I frequent, but there is usually some, well, it's some kind of familiarity with the type of person that usually works there. And, and here I regretfully reveal that I too, I place people in categories. Now, I'm not proud of that, and I try my best to self-check and to not presuppose that someone is like this or like that because of how they dress or what they wear or how they wear their hair or, or how many and where they might have piercings or tattoos. In fact, I try to respond with friendliness and enthusiasm in direct contrast to the way that I think that others might assume I would respond based on their judgment of me, of how I look, the clothes I wear, and that REV that's in front of my name. So when instead of the 30 to 50 something female clerk that I usually saw at this particular store, I looked up and I found that there was a 20 something male clerk. And he did have a little bit of an unusual hairstyle and maybe a few piercings and tattoos that are a little bit beyond what is the norm of, of my generation. So I adjusted my gut reaction to reflect genuine interest in this person, and I greeted him with my warmest smile, and I said, how are you? And he returned my smile and greeting, and then he proceeded to help me get dollars off of my purchase by scanning um, a, a coupon and helping me, me with my store rewards card. So I said, thanks, and I really meant it. Then he said, don't thank me, thank Jesus. Just trying to serve him by serving you better. And I said, well, thanks, I do thank Jesus. And then my confession, after all, I am a minister. Now, okay, I know that there are more female ministers out there now, and there are more in this area than there were when I was growing up. <clears throat> But I think for some folks, especially some folks of other denominations, I just don't look the part. I mean, I look like someone's mom, let's be honest here, or, or an aunt, or perhaps a school teacher, or a, a realtor, or a bank teller, all of which I have been, by the way. But, you know, I'm not that old school type of preacher man, you know, middle age, hair kind of, you know, slick back a little bit. And I'm not the other type, which is kind of that new age hipster guy, you know, with the soul patch and uh, usually bald and ripped jeans and flip flops all year round. I'm not either one of those, okay? So I was neither type that he might have been supposing would be a minister. So he doesn't fit my preconceived notions and I don't fit his. And, and we meet here in the store. And I reveal who I am and what it is I do. So he says to me, where's your church? I said, well, I serve outside the church in a ministry that supports adults with intellectual disabilities. And then I preach sometimes on weekends so my clergy friends can have time away if they need it. And he says, oh, okay, scanning my items. And then the line behind me is getting bigger and bigger and people are getting a little antsy. And he says, can I ask you a question? There it goes. What's he going to ask me? Is it going to be some theology question that's going to stump me or some preacher question that's going to embarrass me? But I say, sure, ask away. And he says, what's the difference between Methodist and Baptist? And I think, hmm, wow, that's a big one. <laughs> okay, how am I going to answer this? And these people behind me are like, you know, looking, they're on their phones, they're, they're, it, four or five people already built up. So I said, okay, let's, let's look at it this way. Methodist and Baptist, we have more in common than we have um, differences. Let me just pick one thing. Um, we kind of disagree a little bit on baptism, okay? Uh, how we view baptism. Um, Methodists baptize babies, okay? And most Baptists 
prefer that you wait until you are of an age of consent. They call it believer's baptism. But Methodists baptize babies because they believe that what happens in baptism is not about them, but it's about what God does. And then when those babies get big enough, they, they decide for themselves. They um, are confirmed in the church and confirmed that they want to be part of God's action that's already been going on in their lives. Much like your young people who were off on their retreat this, this particular weekend. So that's kind of the difference between the two. But really, we have more in common than we have different. And he said, well, I'm a Southern Baptist. I said, well, I'm a United Methodist. Good to meet you. End of the conversation, the people behind me were really kind of put out that we were taking so long. So I finished, hurried out, dodged those irritated glances, and, you know, I would have liked to continue the conversation, but it was not the time or the place. Now, we all do this, don't we? We draw divisions between groups of people. You know, we're, we're white or middle-aged or middle-class, and we're not like people of different color or ethnic background or socioeconomic groups or ethnic identities. And we draw lines at political parties, at social standing, whether we're management or blue-collar workers, whether we're men or women or black or white or brown or Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or Jew. And then, then we come today to this Epiphany Sunday. Epiphany, which means literally a surprise revealing. And we read in the scripture this morning these words. The Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ through the gospel. You know, at the time that Paul was writing these words from prison, the debate in the early church, which, as you know, it was made up entirely at first of Jews who became Christians, the debate was about whether Christ had not come just for this chosen race, the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles as well. And this, this was a divisive issue. The comfortable status quo was that the Israelites, they were separate. And their God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Isaac, was their God. To accept that this God their God had sent his son to open the doors to everyone. Well, to some people, that was really abhorrent. Much as it might be in some churches today, when we open the door to everyone, to people who, who don't look like us, who don't dress like us, who don't act like us, who don't live like us. But that, folks, that, that is the epiphany, the surprise revealing the light has come into the world, not to shine a light on our differences, not to expose our sins, but to reveal God's purpose that was there from the very, very beginning. You see, the big news is this. Through Christ, we have access to God, unlimited access to a life that, that unites us as co-heirs. This is startling news, I know, but there it is. I, I don't have to latch on to this love everyone kind of mentality just because it's a popular thing right now. But I do have to understand that I don't have a corner on God. What many people see <coughs> when they see Christians are people who herd themselves together. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> separate. People that are separate from this corrupt world and make pronouncements about the depravity of those outsiders. <coughs> what I am here to tell you today and what Paul was saying to the church in Ephesus is that the big news is that God doesn't come just for us. The insiders. God didn't just offer mercy and grace to the Jews. <coughs> God through Christ reveals 
the master plan, that we're all in on it. And we don't get to decide who, who gets into the club and who's left standing at the gate. You see, Christ has come. Now, Emeril, that, that great chef, might say it like this. Bam! Surprise! But the bad news for the powers to be is that this revelation is a life-changing, wall-removing wrecker ball. For there to be change, there has to be discomfort. Existing structures will need to be raised to make room. This wall that we have placed between us and the world, while it may have made this sanctuary, our sanctuaries, our churches, nice, safe places to retreat, is a dividing wall that may need to come down. Just as the overlords of Paul's day were not happy with the Jesus movement, there are those of this day who will not be happy that we welcome all to the table that we no longer regard each other as strangers or aliens, but as fellow heirs, a sharer in the promise. You know, breaching holy, holy boundaries was and is, it's an awful lot to swallow. We have to get past the idea that church is a place of comfort and familiarity and sameness and embrace the fact that Christ calls us to be agents of change, agents of hope. And you know what? Every time I find my walls breached and torn apart, every time I find my personal world turned upside down, I find what C.S. Lewis said to be true. There are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. So in the aftermath of Christmas, after the shepherds and wise men have left the stage, after the startling revelation that Christ has come for all, what is it that you and I are called to do? Well, let me tell you, we are called to be doers, not just hearers of the word. It is not a call to occasionally do nice things or, or even pay it forward as nice as those token actions can be. It is a call to look around you and see who is on the outside of our nice church walls, perhaps looking in and longing to be invited in, or perhaps they're hurrying past so as not to be disappointed again by the good church-going people who look the other way and do not see the pain in their lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in The Cost of Discipleship, said that judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. And so, in all humility, I ask God forgiveness when I look at any of my fellow heirs with judgment or disdain. They too are God's most precious children. They too are called to the feast of God's mercy. What theologian David Bartlett calls a most astonishing feast for a most astonishing group of guests. Today's surprising, startling revelation shines in the light of Christ. Come to us in the flesh worshipped by humble shepherds, heavenly angels, and foreign kings. God has come for us all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.